Hello, everybody. Just going to give it a minute as attendees filter in. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, How a Focused Budgeting Activity Increased Savings Across the Hungry Season in Zambia. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I just want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom of your screen, you're going to see most of your controls. First, please introduce yourself in the chat. Network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button. It's in the toolbar on the left. And indicate who your question is for. You can ask questions throughout the event, and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Lastly, we're recording this event, and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. That's including the slide deck. You can find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready as well. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to Kelsey Jack, Associate Professor at USAID, er, sorry, at UC Santa Barbara. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share this work with you. This is uh, a, a joint work with several co-authors that I'll introduce in just a moment, but first let me acknowledge and thank funding support for this research from USAID, which you can see on the slide, but more specifically from the Feed the Future Lab for Markets, Risk and Resilience and from the Development Innovations uh, Venture. So this work, let me uh, pivot actually to the, the kind of slightly more research and, and academic title that we've been using for this project, which is uh, which is budget neglect and consumption smoothing, a field experiment on seasonal hunger. And so as we go through this work, uh, you'll I think see why we're why we're specifically calling it calling it that. And I should point out that this is work with a couple of co-authors from Berkeley, Ned Augenblick, Sapreet Kaur, and Nick Swanson, all at UC Berkeley. Nick is a, is a PhD student currently, and we're also collaborating with Felix Messier at the University of Zambia, who's a longtime collaborator of mine. So let me start by kind of motivating the study that we designed. So if you look around the world at different settings, you see a very consistent pattern, particularly among low income households, which is what we call consumption cycles. That there are times of the year or times of the month when resources are abundant and people have plenty to eat. And there are times of the year or times of the month when resources become quite constrained and in different settings, people cope in different ways. And so we're calling these consumption cycles because they tend to be tied to when people receive income. What you see on the left here is a, a, a graph from a previous study of mine where we found that in rural agricultural Zambia, what happened Happens is that around harvest time, uh, sort of toward, you know, what in North America we would think of as the fall, very few households in this setting report having insufficient food available. But if you look to what is referred to locally as the hungry season, which you can see very clearly in this figure peaks in February, uh, nearly 60% of households are reporting having inadequate food. And so this is kind of a classic indication that we see across the, the, the agricultural settings in low and middle income countries where households harvest their food and then they draw it down over the course of the year. And rather than sort of what we would think of as, as smoothing or saving that, that harvest resources in a way that allows them to maintain their consumption over the course of the year, instead what we see are these patterns where leading up to the next kind of arrival of income, leading up to the next harvest, uh, people are really becoming very, very food constrained. You can see from the figure on the right here that this is not just a phenomenon that we see in agricultural, rural, uh, low income settings, but rather this is something that cuts across settings. This is moving to a very, very different type of setting, which is uh, US food stamp cycles. So these are recipients uh, in the United States, low income households that are getting government benefits at the start of the month. What you see from this is that over the course of the month, households are actually reducing their caloric consumption shortly after they get the resources through their government transfers. They have 
abundant resources, they consume well, but then over the course of the month, they draw down those savings, they draw down that stock, and by the end of the month, their caloric consumption has actually dropped. So these are kind of striking facts that are known in the literature, that are known by, by, by practitioners. What we, we kind of start, start by this puzzle of, you know, why is it the households are not doing sort of what we might think of as, as really adequate smoothing of their resources over time from one income to the next income. And we add to this some uh, observations that are a little bit less known. So what we did is we went to uh, farmers in Zambia, the people who underlie the figure that I just showed you of these very clear kind of agricultural cycles in, in consumption. And we wanted to understand better what is it that is driving these patterns. And so what we did is we started by just asking people to forecast what their savings would be several months into the future. So we came to them at this time of the year, shortly after the conclusion of harvesting and processing their, these are maize farmers, uh, harvesting and processing their maize, and asked them to predict how much maize they would have three months later. So this is basically asking them at a time of the year when their resources are relatively abundant, how much of those resources are still going to be available to you three months from now. We made this uh, a, a forecast that we were asking of them, one that they should try hard to get right by offering them uh, some, uh, some compensation if their guess was reasonably accurate. So you can see here it says this is incentivized. We paid them when we actually came back three months later and checked whether their predictions were correct or not. Uh, if they were close, if they were in sort of half a bag of maize, then they got some compensation. And so what we find, what this figure is showing you is the, the diamond, the kind of marker on this figure is what they guess, what they predicted they would have in terms of maize savings three months later. So this is the time of year when they're starting to get into this kind of constrained period. This is at harvest time, what they forecasted they would have still available to them. And then the yellow, the bar is showing what they actually had. So when we went back and checked and actually observed how much maize was still remaining, what we see is that their expectations far exceed what they actually ended up having available. In fact, 80% of the people who we asked were overly optimistic about the resources that they would have available to them in three months. What's perhaps even more striking is that when we ask people, what is the worst case scenario? What is the kind of minimum amount that you think you might have available? 65% of them are still overly optimistic. They still end up with less than what they forecast the worst case scenario might uh, look like in terms of available resources. Then we do some additional work to try to understand, well, well what drives this? What, what seems to be causing people to be overly optimistic about how much they're going to be able to save from harvest time through to the time when they're entering into the hungry season? And what we find, again, this is sort of descriptive evidence. This is really trying to motivate the project that I'm going to explain to you today. But what we find is that people seem to be underestimating how much they're going to spend out of their maize harvest. And so specifically what we do here is, again, kind of a similar forecasting exercise. We ask people, again, around harvest time, when they have a lot of resources in front of them, how much of those resources are you going to spend on things other than food? And what we find is that what they actually spend far exceeds what they forecast they're going to have to spend. And in fact, we, we see that it's about you know, off by half. So, so they're, they're, they're uh, spending roughly twice as much as they forecast they're going to spend. And this can explain a very large share of what I showed you on the previous slide of this kind of over-optimism and how much savings they'll have available. It seems to be driven by sort of underestimating how much they're going to actually have to dip into their uh, maze for non-food kinds, uh, kinds of expenditures. OK, so these are the facts that uh, really motivated the design of what I'm going to talk about today. These are things where you could think of lots of different explanations for you know, why we might see these types of patterns. What we're going to do in this study is hypothesize one particular type of an explanation. We're going to design an intervention that tries to address 
that type of an explanation. And then we're going to test that intervention. And so what I'm going to show you today is a field experiment that tests an intervention that tries to correct the types of patterns that I'm showing you, for example, on this slide. The fact that people seem to, at harvest time, underestimate how much they're going to have to spend. And what that does is that leads them to undersave because they don't feel like they need to save as much for the expenditures that they're going to make. So I'll kind of repeat that idea a few times as we go. Uh, and um, you know, hopefully, hopefully uh, our, our idea will become clear as we, as we go through this. OK, so the hypothesis to be a little bit more kind of concrete about it, it's something that we're going to call budget neglect. And, and so you saw in the, in the title that I gave, um, we're, we're thinking about this new kind of idea of something called budget neglect. And the, the basic point here is the idea that people misperceive their, how, how tight their budget is. So, and this is because of the thing that I showed you on the previous slide that people seem to not fully account for all of their future expenditures. And when I say expenditures, what you should be thinking about is not just the things that you know you're going to have to spend money on, but also the things that happen that are kind of unexpected, like somebody falls ill, a relative comes to visit. These are things that are going to require expenditures, but that are things that you know, may be hard to predict. And so any one of those things may be somewhat low probability, but the idea that something is going to happen that you're going to have to spend money on that you didn't really expect there's a very high likelihood of that. So what this does is this creates sort of over-optimism about how much resources are going to be available. If you underestimate how much you're going to have to spend, you think, oh, well, I'll have plenty of resources available. And what that means is that you feel sort of less constrained, so you end up spending more money early on before you realize that your forecasts were actually off. This is very closely related to, I to an idea from the social psychology literature that, that some people on this, uh, on this seminar may have heard about, something called the planning fallacy. What that's done is, is typically applied to planning problems where you're thinking about how much time is it going to take me, for example, to prepare slides for this seminar. And I think, oh, it'll take you know, just a few hours. But what I forget is all the steps that are involved. And so I'm overly optimistic about you know, how much time I have available. So, you know, perhaps I under kind of save in a time sense and I end up having to scramble and stay up late or do whatever. You know, of course, not for these slides, not for you, but, uh, but you get the idea of the, the kind of example here. Okay, so the idea of what uh, this project is going to do, as I mentioned, is it's trying to, to kind of remove this bias and how people forecast uh, uh, in terms of looking forward and how people think about their future expenditures. So we're gonna try to draw people's attention to all of the expenses that they should have in their mind when they're thinking about, well, how much can I spend today? How much can I afford to spend today? The more you can be thinking about kind of the full set of things that you're going to have to spend on over the course of the year, the more that's going to make you realize that actually resources are quite tight today so I should spend less, therefore have more savings into the future. So, you know, for, for those of you who are, who are coming at this from kind of more of a research perspective, let me just very quickly point out that what we're going to be describing is going to be distinct from some other kinds of explanations that have been put forward for, you know, why is it that people potentially undersave? So something like you know, a, a, a present bias, sort of uh, time and consistency. Some of you, some of you may be familiar with these kind of ideas. What we're going to be introducing has that doesn't really have features of what we might think of as a commitment device. Rather, it's really functioning through these beliefs. It's functioning through how much do you expect to have to spend in the future, and how does that in turn shape your behavior today? Okay, very, very good. So. That's meant to be kind of the, the overview of where we're headed. What I'm gonna do now is tell you more about this context. So as I, as I showed you on the figures that, that I put up before, we're gonna be working with a group of farmers in rural Zambia. This is a setting that I've been doing research in for about 12 years now um, and learning you know, so much as I go. This annual cycle of kind of harvest followed by a lean season or a hungry season is, very widespread in Zambia, but it's also very common in many, many other settings, as I, as I mentioned before. 
So let me tell you a bit more about our particular version of, of that pattern. This is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the farmers, the sample of farmers that we're working with are primarily maize farmers. So the, a large share of their income comes from their maize harvest. They harvest maize once per year, and they tend to store that maize in large grain bags, so 50 kilogram grain bags at home. This creates a very useful setting for us as researchers, because what this looks like is basically people are getting their more or less their entire annual paycheck at one point during the year, and then they're consuming out of that over the remaining course of the year. So what they have to do is what you know we call kind of an eat the pie type of problem, meaning that they get all of their resources, and then they have to figure out how to divide it up over the course of the year. And so some of the things that they have to allocate these resources to include consumption. So they eat maize, uh, and so they're using, they're allocating some of that maize toward consumption, but they're also using it basically as a bank account. So they're spending it on things like school fees or farming inputs, but they also, as I mentioned before, have to think about all of the unexpected expenditures. So how much needs to get set aside to cover health expenses, to cover funerals, to cover visitors, to cover other things that might not be quite as easy to forecast as something like school fees or, uh, or other inputs. So the point is that there's a very large range of kind of potential expenditures, but also unexpected things like shock that households need to set aside resources for at harvest time so that they can cover those when they come up later in the year. So the intuition for what kind of our idea of budget neglect is bringing to this is the idea that at harvest time when households are thinking about, well, how should I allocate my maize over the course of the year? That they're not fully accounting for all of the potential expenditures, the uncertain things and the certain things. And what this means is that expenses that happen around harvest time are going to, to tend to be kind of overspent on, that, that if households feel like they don't have so many things that they have to plan for over the course of the year, it makes you feel relatively rich. And so you spend a little bit more today. What this means though, of course, is that these households are drawing down their savings so when later in the year actually arrives, they have less than they expected they would. And so they have to spend less on future expenditures. So this gives rise to these patterns of consumption cycles that I showed you on this first slide. But of course, if households are forgetting some of these future expenses, they're not gonna be thinking about this kind of effect. And so when you ask them to predict their future savings, they'll look overly optimistic because they'll be looking as if they're, they're not sort of fully anticipating all that they're gonna to have to spend coming out of the, the harvest. This helps set up the intervention that we're gonna be testing out, which is in many ways kind of very, very simple. It's just saying, well, if we can help people understand all of these expenditures or remember all of these expenditures, this may affect their beliefs and therefore their behavior. And so that's, that's uh, again, the goal, the goal in, this, in this project and in this study. So we borrow from the psychology literature in designing the intervention that we test out. So there are kind of two things that you should have in mind when we, uh, when we describe the specific intervention. The first is something that uh, researchers who, who study this kind of thing called the planning fallacy that I mentioned have documented, which is that if you can get people to think through a big problem by breaking it into small, small parts, there's something called the segmentation effect, that people will appreciate more of what goes into that big, difficult planning problem than if you just ask them about that problem as a whole. So I mentioned that the planning fallacy has, has often been used in settings where people are thinking about how do I plan in terms of time? And so in those kinds of things, if you ask somebody, how much time is it gonna take you to write that book? They may be very overly optimistic. It's not gonna take, you know, it'll take a year or something like that. Whereas if you ask them to break it out into many, many small steps, how long is it gonna take you to, you know, write the outline, to figure out references, to I've never written a book, I don't know exactly what goes into it, but if you break it out into these, into these individual pieces, the people are more accurate in estimating how long it's actually going to take them. So we borrow that idea and try to think about how do we adapt that for this uh, maze problem that farmers in Zambia are facing. 
We also ask them to think carefully through their past expenditures because there's a large literature growing on trying to understand memory. And one important thing about uh, uh, memory is that people are good at sort of recalling things once you get them started. So the more you can get people to think about certain things that they'll remember things that are kind of adjacent to that one thing. Okay, so taking these two insights, we're gonna test kind of three main predictions and I'll explain in just a moment specifically the intervention that we actually do. But the three predictions that we're going to think come out of this kind of, a, of, an, of an exercise are going to be first, that if this works in helping people like pull more things into their minds that they need to plan for in terms of how much they're gonna to have to spend, that this should increase their forecast of future expenditures. So this should help in that uh, figure that I showed you, this should help bring kind of people's forecasts closer to the amount that they're actually going to have to spend. Second, we should expect that their willingness to spend on things today as a result of this actually goes down. And then finally, if we follow people over time, we should expect that they're spending more evenly or consuming more evenly over the course of the year, that they're allocating these resources in a kind of smoother way over the agricultural calendar. What we actually do in terms of the intervention, in many ways, again, is, is very simple. And what I'm going to make sure we have time for is to talk about kind of the, the how general these findings might be and what other types of settings they might be relevant for. And so we designed something that we thought was actually quite general that could be quite applicable to other settings where you see these kinds of consumption cycles. So specifically, what this is showing you is this kind of budget board, what we're going to call a budget board, which is just an aid. It's just a visual aid to help people think through what are all of the things that they need to save for. OK, and so what you see from this is that there are kind of seven main categories. We did very extensive uh, field work in Eastern Zambia to try to understand what were these expenditures, what format of a planning board or budgeting board would actually work, and so on. What we do is around this time when households have finished shelling their maize, uh, but still kind of shortly after harvest, is we go to these households and we show them this budget board. We ask them how much uh, maize they have available to be spending and saving over the course of the year. We give them some tax that represent their budget. So these are the number of maize bags that we have. And then the enumerator. So when I say we, this is a team of, of, of Zambian enumerators, implementers. They ask people to allocate those thumbtacks over these seven categories. So we ask them, you know, how much are you going to need to consume for your family over each month? How much do you want to spend on school fees, on household supplies, farm inputs, transfers, and then health shocks and emergencies? And then there's kind of an other category in case households have major expenditures that we that we haven't thought about. The enumerators are very carefully trained not to you know, give any kind of coaching or assistance or tell people where their maize bags actually belong. So this is just really an allocation exercise that the household is undertaking itself using information that is already in their heads about what they need to be to be planning for. And so what this this visual aid is doing and this kind of exercise is doing is just a more methodical way of really carefully thinking through and also having to balance the budget, right? So having to realize how constrained resources are so that how they're allocated across these categories can't exceed, for example, how much resources are actually available to people. Households can move the pens around, do other things like that until they're satisfied uh, with, their, with their actual budget. Okay, so this is the main part of what we actually do. And again, it's, it's, a, it's an intervention that is fairly light touch in the sense that we're not coming in and telling households what they should do. We're not coming in and reminding households of particular things that they've forgotten. Rather, we're giving kind of scaffolding or a framework that households can then use to aid their own budgeting process. So when you ask farmers in this setting, do you plan for the year? A large share of them say, yes, at harvest time, we think about how much we need to save for the year. After they've gone through this budgeting exercise, we come back to them later and we ask them some more kind of qualitative questions about how this compares to the type of budgeting that they usually do. And almost unanimously, they say this is much more detailed and much more thorough than the types of budgeting that they usually do. So this kind of aid seems to help people recall more expenses than the type of budgeting that they do otherwise. 
Okay, so we, uh, in terms of how we implemented this, we embedded this, uh, this exercise in a baseline survey that we did with households. Households are randomly assigned to either a treatment, treatment or a control. So what we're trying to do here is test in a causal way whether this type of budgeting exercise has a meaningful impact on people's beliefs about their future expenditure needs, but also about their behavior, and importantly about how smooth their expenditures and consumption can be over the course of the agricultural calendar. So we need a control group in order to measure that. So what we do again is we randomly assign households to a treatment where they get this budgeting exercise or to a control where they just undertake whatever budgeting exercise they would do normally. In both groups, we're going to be collecting data to be able to measure the impact of this budgeting exercise. So the last thing that I want to point out is that we were a little bit concerned that if households um, undertook this kind of exercise, they remembered a lot of expenses that they had previously forgotten. This happens in September. What we're really worried about is how much resources they're going to have in February, for example, during the peak of the hungry season. There's a lot of time in between there. And so rather than having to redo this planning exercise on their own or this budgeting exercise on their own all the time to avoid forgetting these additional expenses, we wanted to give them some kind of an aid. So we offered household labels that they could put on their maze bags to help them kind of encode this plan that they had made. I want to be clear that we don't think this is driving most of the results that I'm going to show you today because many of the outcomes that we document happened before households got these uh, these labels, which were only supplied to them two months later after they had finished bagging up uh, um, all of their all of their uh, all of their maids. Okay, very good. So we're working with about uh, 840 households spread across 113 villages. We're randomizing households into treatment and control at the household level instead of at the village level. And the reason for this is, is really kind of statistical power. Um, and, and we have relatively few households per village. So, you know, if you're concerned about kind of some spillovers between treatment and control, we think these are going to be relatively modest. And we also think that if anything, this is going to lead us to kind of underestimate uh, our, our potential uh, treatment effects. I'll show you the data collection kind of as we go, but we revisit these households at, at somewhat high frequency. This is the year that uh, that COVID hit in early 2020. So there's going to be a pause in some of our data collection, but we will be able to go back around harvest time and ask people some questions that'll give us some insights in terms of how uh, in terms of how people are actually smoothing over the full uh, agricultural cycle. All right. So if you recall, um, we we think that agents are forgetting, so households are forgetting some of their future expenses. Our treatment is going to make these households think through their future expenses more thoroughly. And so we're going to go through these predictions that I showed you on an earlier slide to really try to follow them in the data that we collect. So the first thing that we need to see is if this intervention is actually working, we should expect that people's forecasts of how much they're going to have to spend out of their May savings should be going up. So this is the first thing we see. We ask people before we do the budgeting exercise, how much do you think you're going to have to spend? So very similar to the, to, the, to the figure that I showed you at the beginning. How much do you think you're going to have to spend over the course of this year on things other than food? All right, that's what you can see in this blue line on this figure is the distribution of how households are expecting to have to allocate uh, their, their maize, sort of conditional on how much maize they actually have to allocate. Then after they go through this budgeting exercise, we just add up based on you know, their thumbtack uh, placement. They just add up, well, how much uh, are, are, am I actually going to, to need to allocate to non-food expenses? And what you can see in the red line is that this is shifted to the right. And so what that means is that they're increasing their forecast of how much they're going to need to spend. What this is gonna do is make their budget feel tighter because they're realizing actually there are more expenditures than they had previously been accounting for. In particular, we see that the estimates of how much they need to save for non-food expenditures is increasing by 20 to 60% relative to whatever kind of budgeting exercise they had done before we showed up and, and went through this exercise with them. 
Okay, so this is kind of the first evidence. This is just showing you something on belief that this kind of simple budget exercise can have a meaningful impact on how much people estimate that they're going to need to save for these kind of non-food types of expenditures. Now what we wanna do is understand whether this is actually affecting behavior. So we're gonna start with a kind of stylized measure, but one that happens immediately that helps us understand whether when you realize you're gonna to have to save more to spend on future non-food expenditures, if that really makes your budget feel tighter, you should be less willing to spend on other things, kind of discretionary things today. So what we do here is we, uh, we measure people's willingness to pay, how much they're willing to spend on some discretionary consumption. Specifically, we replicate kind of a feature of the local setting, which is something called briefcase buyers. These are uh, traders who come around shortly after harvest and ask people, kind of sell sort of tempting, slightly tempting things to people, things like, you know, maybe some cloth or a radio or other things like that. And, uh, and typically trade with uh, uh, th these items for maize for households. And so what we do is kind of try to replicate that. We're offering certain items at, at somewhat subsidized prices, but we're still offering them in exchange for maize and trying to elicit how much are people willing to pay for these items either in the control group where they haven't just gone through this budgeting exercise versus in the treatment group where they have just gone for this budgeting exercise. And based on the results I just showed you, they've increased their estimate of how much they're going to need to save for other kinds of expenditures. And consistent with what we predict, what we see is that treated households, again, shown by this red line, shift their willingness to pay to the left, meaning they're willing to pay less than households in the control group and it's a fairly large reduction. So they're willing to pay 34% less on these kinds of discretionary consumption items. So very specifically, uh, we're looking at radios, we're looking at, uh, at cloth, at, at chitenges, um, and at solar panels. So these are all things that are kind of really nice to have, but if you really feel like your budget is very tight, maybe better not to spend very much money on them. And that is indeed what we, what we see. We're actually, this is kind of a real, purchase exercise. So this is real stakes. People are actually, you know, trading for these things. So we should think of this as a real measure of actual uh, behavior in this setting. Okay, so that's some initial evidence that we can, through this budget exercise, affect people's beliefs about the coming year and affect their immediate behavior. What you're probably really concerned about, and we were really concerned about is, well, fine, that's important, that's good, but what we really wanna see is does this impact behavior over the course of the agricultural calendar, which is when we see these kinds of consumption cycles that I was describing before. So what we're gonna be looking at now is over the course of the, the agricultural year, do we see kind of a flatter spending profile versus this high spending right after harvest followed by very low spending uh, during the hungry season. So what this figure is showing you Again, the red line shows the treatment group, the control uh, group is shown in this blue line, is that there indeed is this kind of flattening of expenditures. So this is um, using the data that we collect when we go and we actually verify how much maize people have and how much cash people have at different points during the year. As these savings are kind of drawn down, we can calculate how much they're spending. And what we see is that consistent with the last result that I showed you, the treatment group lowers its spending early in the year. So you can see that the red line is below the blue line early in the year, but that as we follow households into the hungry season, which if you recall kind of peaks in, in, in February, that at that point in time, the treatment group actually has higher spending than the control group because they have more resources available to them. So this is the first evidence that actually these are meaningful impacts that last throughout the year and affect the resources that people have available and can spend on different types of, uh, of expenditure needs over this entire agricultural cycle. Again, this is, uh, you can see that this graph stops in uh, kind of late February, because again, that is when uh, research got shut down because of, of, of COVID. And so we don't have data through March, April, et cetera, but I will show you some results that come from the following September when we go back and ask people about harvest uh, outcomes. Okay, so um, actually, let me show you, let me say, point out one other thing. So 
the implications of this additional uh, saving that happens over the course of the year, you know, it's, it's hard to tell from these lines how big of an effect this is. So there's a bullet over here that I just want to make sure I'm, I'm pointing out, which is that households are entering the hungry season with one additional month's worth of grain. So they're actually able to save enough to cover consumption needs for their household for an additional month. Entering into the hungry season, this is a really meaningful impact in terms of the resources that people have available at this most constrained uh, time of the year. All right, very good. So let me talk now through a few implications of what we might see in this setting because of the fact that people have more resources available to them and the fact that they're able to spend more later uh, in the agricultural season. This is a setting where households are starting to, so everybody's engaged in agriculture in this sample. Households are, are uh, needing to spend money on agricultural inputs after they've started to draw down their, their savings over the course of the year. So planting and other agricultural activities are starting you know, around the time that we start to, to visit people, but they're really extending into November, December, and then even through the hungry season. And so there are kind of two reasons that we might think that more spending later in the year could actually be good for agricultural production. The first is that households have to spend on, on agricultural inputs. So things like hiring labor from the market, things like buying fertilizer, herbicides, other things like that. Um, so that's one thing. If this additional spending that I showed you that happens later in the year, some of that could be going to agricultural inputs, that may help increase production. And then second, in prior work, we documented that households in, in many cases during the peak of the hungry season are selling some of their household labor off the farm in order to get some cash today to cover some consumption needs. And so if households don't have to do as much of that because they have more resources available, this may allow them to reallocate some of their household labor back onto their own farms, which also could be helpful for production, but it just more generally may, you know, allow households to avoid doing some of what's locally called ganyu, which is these short run kind of labor contracts that, that uh, households often do during the hungry season. Okay, so what we wanna test now is whether the fact that households in the control group appear to be understaving relative to their expenditure needs, therefore spending less later during the year, whether that actually affects uh, agricultural output in this setting. What we find, and apologies, this is a table with a very small font and a lot in it. So let me try to walk you through some of the kind of key things to take away from this. The first is that this first column is showing you data from when we came back to households uh, after the subsequent harvest. So recall, we did this intervention with treated households shortly after 2019 harvest. This is coming back to them after the 2020 harvest and asking about the impacts that that intervention had on that full agricultural cycle all the way through to their next harvest time. What we find is that there's an increase in the amount of maize that they were able to harvest. There's an increase in their total revenue from agriculture. These are meaningful increases that are about eight or 9% relative to the control group because of this budgeting treatment that we did. There's kind of a, a somewhat noisy estimate on fertilizer and chemical expenditures, but these do go up. And in addition to that, we see some evidence that, um, that hired labor also goes up in the setting. So this does appear consistent with the idea that households are able to uh, invest more in their farms when they're able to save resources until later in the agricultural cycle, and that this does have a positive impact on agricultural production in this setting. In addition, if we look at some uh, other kinds of consumption outcomes, we can also see that, uh, that households are eating a little bit more early in the hungry season, they're reducing small meals. And then importantly, if you look at these last two columns, what we see is that later in the, in the year, sort of during the hungry season, when a lot of households are forced to do ganyu, uh, because, uh, because they need, sorry, ganyu, the, the uh, local labor sales of their, of their household labor, to get some income to cover consumption, that households reduce that a lot after they've had this budget exercise. And we think that's largely because they're able to plan better such that they have more resources available and don't have to rely on these kind of short run labor contracts that are often you know, not viewed very favorably uh, uh, by households that have to do them. Okay, so 
what this tells us is that this budget exercise shortly after harvest time has impacts and implications for households that function, we think, through their beliefs about how much they're going to have to spend later in the year and therefore how much they have to save. When households go through this budget exercise, they remember more of their future expenditures and therefore they cut back on spending today around harvest time. And this allows them to increase their savings later in the year such that they can more kind of optimally invest in their own production activities. And so this is something, you know, in some ways it's a little bit specific about this setting where everybody's involved in their own production, but I'm gonna show you in just a minute that we have some evidence that this generalizes to a number of different other types of settings where it may not be agricultural production that we think is being affected, but maybe other kinds of things. You know, if households are running out of resources and having to take payday loans, for example, that also has really negative impacts on that household's kind of overall financial outlook. So here we see this in the form of agricultural production, but you might imagine that across different contexts, it's not necessarily showing up through agricultural production, but through other things that households are having to do in order to cope. Here, one of the things that households have to do if savings have been depleted at the time that they're making investments is underinvest. They don't have as much resources available during the hungry season or leading into the hungry season to optimally invest in their own uh, production. All right, so the last thing that I'm gonna show you is that uh, this is kind of some additional evidence that, that this mechanism that we're, that we're you know, putting forward in this project seems to be really driving a lot of this behavior is that when, when we look at the impacts on savings, it does indeed seem like the biggest treatment effect that we're able to see on savings outcomes is indeed coming from the subset of households in our data set and our study who were most kind of inaccurate in their own savings forecast, the ones who are the most overly optimistic, which if you recall, we think it's sort of underlying all of these, uh, all of these kinds of patterns. Okay, excellent. So let me turn now, uh, and I think this, this may take us through to the, to the end of the seminar, but let me turn now to sort of what we think are some of the implications in terms of how might the insights that come out of this setting in Zambia extend to other settings, first of all, and then what do they also imply for thinking about policy or the design of interventions to help households better save and better smooth and, and reduce some of these kind of cycles and consumption that I showed you at the start. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is, um, if you recall at the beginning, I compared two different settings where we see these kinds of consumption cycles. I wanna pivot for a moment from rural Zambia to low income households in California, all right? So this is a very different setting, but it's also a setting where we see some evidence that households are not able to smooth the resources that they have, in this case, over a month. So in some ways you might think, well, this is an easier problem. It's not the full agricultural year. It's just from one uh, time when people are receiving benefits until the next time that they're receiving benefits. Yet I showed you at the beginning that we still have evidence that households are consuming less calories as you get further and further away from the time that they're getting the, uh, the this is kind of the, the new version of the, the food stamps, the SNAP uh, benefits. So as I mentioned, these benefits arrive at the start of the month. And what we do here is we work with these households It's a very small scale intervention just to try to understand how generalizable the results I showed you before actually are across context. And so we do a very modified version of, uh, of this, this, the same budgeting exercise that I explained before of just asking households to think about their expenses across different categories. So a very similar thing to the to the budgeting board. These are households that are not, you know, saving in maize. They're saving in, in cash for the most part. And so what we want to know is, does this intervention, just asking people to kind of unpack what are all the different things, enumerate what are all the different things that you're going to have to save for, that you're going to need to spend money on over the course of the month, and then testing again. Just now, this is survey data, kind of self-reported um, expected expenditures and how optimistic people are about how they're going to be able to save. Okay, so small sample. Again, this is just to give uh, some insight into how, how general do, you, do we actually think this, this might be. 
So the first thing that um, I'm showing you is that, that um, in this sample of low income households in California, we see kind of a similar thing of households that appear to be consistently running out of resources before the end of the month. So we ask people things like, uh, you know, do you, do you agree? Is it sometimes often never, et cetera, that there are some months where more expenses come up than I had initially expected. What you can see from that is the gray bars, people are saying sometimes often or always, versus there are months when less expenses come up than I had initially expected, sometimes rarely or never. Okay, so this is some initial suggestion that some of these same kinds of challenges in accurately forecasting what expenses are likely to be, but that's fairly common in this, uh, in this set of households. And again, like the farmers in Zambia, this is not a surprise, right? These are households that receive these benefits at the start of the month, month after month after month, just like many of the households in the agricultural setting in Zambia have experienced these consumption cycles, the cycle of harvest and hungry season year after year after year, in some case for decades. So now some of these households have gone through uh, this, this kind of unpacking exercise, this budgeting exercise in this California sample. And again, we can compare some of the same things that we did in uh, the sample in Zambia. So for example, how much did households anticipate that they were going to have to spend over the course of the month before versus after they go through this, uh, this budgeting exercise where they have to allocate expenses across different categories. And what you can see here is very consistent with what we saw among agricultural households in Zambia is that a large share of them, 85% in this case, revise their expenses upward meaning that their initial forecast of how much they're going to spend is too low and that the average kind of underestimate or the average increase is about 51 percent. We can also ask households uh, how much they expect to have in savings at the end of the month. So this is after you know those expenses has, have, have been incurred. How much do you expect to have uh, in savings? When we ask them before the budgeting exercise, they're overly optimistic. Again, very consistent with what we saw in Zambia. They're overly optimistic about how much resources they'll have available. Once they've gone through this budget exercise, they revise downward and feel more pessimistic about how much savings they'll have available, a revision downward of about 34%. So we think that this is pretty nice evidence that what we found in Zambia is not just a function of you know, farmers in the eastern province in Zambia, one, or even households in agricultural settings in you know, lower middle income uh, settings. So um, with this, let me pivot to, uh, to kind of what I, can, what I can conclude with, which is that you know, we think that the policy implications from this do extend uh, somewhat broadly. So this is a, a fairly light touch intervention, as I said before, basically we're spending some time to, uh, to work with households, to uh, give them some tools, again, not prescribe anything about how savings should happen, anything like that, um, but rather just you know, giving some, some tools that, that we think aid the budgeting process. This is distinct from some of the uh, types of interventions that you know, that practitioners and, and others have tested out in these types of settings, which include things like, you know, giving credit uh, during the during the lean season, which include uh, supporting you know, migration during the lean season, other things like that. This is distinct in that it allows households to just work with the resources that they have available. It doesn't require outside resources, but allocate those resources in a way that over the course of the agricultural calendar, you know, may actually benefit uh, households in pretty substantial ways. We think that this type of relatively simple intervention could be adapted to any number of different settings. So if you think about settings where households have difficulty smoothing resources, difficulty smoothing income from one period to the next, uh, this could be, you know, cash transfer recipients, for example. So if households are getting cash transfers like the government benefits that I showed you in the sample in, in California, that making those cash transfers last from one arrival through to the next may be something that's challenging for households. We also think that it's applicable, again, not just to rural settings, but potentially to, uh, to urban settings as well. 
and so you know i would love during the during the discussion or other things to you know to be thinking a lot together about what are some of the different settings where where this might be applicable and in fact with support from from usaid and div we're kind of actively exploring ways in which we might scale up this work uh again both in agricultural settings but potentially also thinking much more uh much more broadly and so let me let me actually go ahead and, and wrap up with that with the kind of concluding comment that you know we are looking for for partners to try to explore the the scalability of this the replicability of this uh to be about able to evaluate some of the impacts in in other other contexts and then potentially to also just be helping organizations organizations or other implementers adapt these kinds of ideas to other settings where they might be incorporated into some other kind of program, not necessarily as a standalone thing, but just as a component of, uh, of what's actually being potentially rolled out. Okay, so there's some additional discussion and so on, but I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time, uh, move to our very last uh, concluding slide here, and then uh, pass it over to Harry for some comments. Uh, thank you, Kesley, for that presentation. So colleagues, um, <clears throat> these are the findings uh, which happened in Zambia. And uh, at this point in time, I want to try and um, uh, sort of give you an overview of um, the situation in Zambia regarding this study in terms of why the USID mission here in Lusaka decided to support uh, this activity. So basically, um, Zambia, as some of you may know, uh, relies on on, a, on mining, especially copper, to drive the economy. But um, the big part of the population lives in rural areas, and uh, these are largely small-scale farmers. And they face challenges of producing because uh, they are using uh, um, um, hand hand kind of methods, uh, labor-intensive methods of workers' production. And uh, this kind of always results in producing less than they need for their consumption. And many of them do run out. They cannot uh, keep uh, food enough adequate green stocks to last from one harvest to another. Um, of course, the small scale farmers do play a very big role. The bit of surpluses that they produce is what is bought by government um, food reserve agency and other grain traders. And then they come and sell to the millers in the urban areas for, for feeding the urban population. And this is a cycle that plays. So, but we find that from time to time, a number of, um, of farmers, especially in rural areas would run out of food and uh, they still remain in poverty despite that. And uh, a few statistics would show you that uh, eight out of every 10 Zambians who live in rural areas are classified as poor compared to only two out of 10 uh, those, for those who live in urban areas who are considered as poor. Uh, and uh, because a number of these individuals in rural areas just depend on this subsistence farming, uh, they tend to depend on other options to uh, meet their daily requirements. And uh, in some cases, of course, this has resulted in uh, degradation of the environment, including, you know, um, um, charcoal production, which is, it, it takes uh, just a few, a few, a few days uh, instead of growing a bag of maize, uh, you produce charcoal and sell it in urban areas. Uh, you make the equivalent of a bag of maize, which takes you six months to grow. And so we see this uh, just playing out year in and year out. And uh, as a result of that, you know, our cultural productivity has remained. Uh, uh, very low in terms of its contribution to GDP, only 5%, despite the fact that 66% of you know, the total labor force is involved in agriculture. And, and, and uh, we need to do something about this. And uh, uh, we, uh, right now in the country, for example, we have had uh, uh, an uproar of uh, you know, running out of the same staple of maize, especially in the urban areas, uh, because they depend on this subsidized uh, uh, food, uh, which uh, small scale producers are producing. Uh, you may know some of you that uh, Zambia is um, land linked and is surrounded by a lot of neighbors. And uh, as USID Zambia, we, we, we kind of uh, 
positioning Zambia to uh, to become a regional food basket. And so uh, we have a package of interventions that are trying to address the low productivity among the uh, farming community. We want to increase access to markets for these communities and improve the, the general you know, farming in, uh, environment so that large scale farmers can get into it. So there are a lot of opportunities, but um, we have to unlock this potential and we have to break that cycle, uh, which was highlighted in this uh, presentation, where a lot of people uh, in rural areas run out of food. And to do that, they go to the 30% that remain with food to go and do piecework uh, so that they can meet their food needs. So the, 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 the findings of this study, although they look very simple, it's a tool that I think uh, uh, we can promote and use, I think, in different settings as we had to ensure that um, a lot of uh, 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 people break that cycle and um, can invest their labor during the short, the single, you know, farming season, which is like just from from October to to, to April. Uh, in that way, you know, year in year out, if they start planning, we expect that maybe some of them could come out of uh, that cycle and uh, become self reliant. So this this study is is, is very interesting. Thanks. Uh, uh, Kesley, and, Kesley and your team for, for doing this. Uh, we expect to roll it out with uh, uh, the Minister of Agriculture here and other partners who are involved in working with communities directly and uh, see how it, it can be one of the tools that uh, we can uh, try to increase productivity and end hunger. Yeah, uh, with that, I'll pass it over to you. I think I can um, jump in here. Um, so thank you, Harry, so much for this context and also for being a very active supporter of this research. Um, Harry is an expert in our USAID Zambia mission. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words um, and thank you, Kelsey, for the excellent presenta presentation today. Um, so I'm Crystal Bird Ogbadu and I'm an economist with USAID's Development Innovation Ventures Office. Um, folks keep mentioning Development Innovation Ventures. I'll just talk a little bit about us. Um, but I was the project manager overseeing this grant to Sega um, to implement this research. Um, so just to talk a little bit about DIV, um, for anyone that's on the call today, today that wants to you know know more about div so div is um usai did USAID's Open Innovation Fund, and we invest in breakthrough solutions such as this one um, to some of the world's most intractable development challenges. And so we provide grant funding um, to test new ideas, build evidence of what works, and scale solutions that have the potential to hopefully impact millions of lives um, at a fraction of the usual cost. Um, so in beyond supporting individual innovation, DIV has served as a testing ground for a lot of these kinds of approaches that really push the envelope um, toward more effective development practices. Um, and Harry already touched on um, some of the linkages with the findings of this research and how it can be used, can and will be used in the Zambian context. Um, and then also in one of Kelsey's slides, she touched on how this approach can be applied to SNAP participants, even in the US, and really how general generalizable um, this research is. Um, so from a DIV perspective, um, we really wanna see our innovations go far beyond DIV. Um, and one of the key features of this grant, um, this DIV grant, and why it's very important, it was very important for us to fund, was that it's, you know, building off of their previous research and findings, and then also providing that space for exploration of scaling opportunities in different country contexts, as Kelsey kind of touched on, you know, they're actively still looking for partners and ways to scale and expand this research, because it's such a um, low cost, low touch solution to get at this consumption smoothing. So we're really happy about the findings and having worked with the team. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Kelsey and Christina. Um, I think we're going to get into the Q&A. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, really appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sophie Javers. I work for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Markets, Risk, and Resilience, um, which is another organization along with DIV that helps support uh, this important research. Um, so I'm going to take us into the question and answer uh, session. We have a good, uh, let's say, about 25 minutes or so um, to get into some great conversations. We've had uh, nearly 20 questions come in. Um, so in the interest of time, we're going to try and sort through some of these um, questions. 
if there are some left, which I imagine there will be, um, we will try and um, answer them uh, after the, the webinar is over and, and have it as a resource um, in the post-event resources on AgriLinks. Um, so I will head right into this. And again, Harry and Crystal, um, you know, jump in as well. Um, Christina, you too, um, as we are uh, having these conversations. So I'm going to start with um, a question around, let's see here. Uh, okay, we have uh, a question here from Marcia Croft. And her question is, um, are average maize production levels in smallholder farmer households in Zambia actually high enough um, to last uh, the full 12 months, even with good budgeting? Um, that's uh, something that I think quite a few people were, were wondering about. Here. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. And I was able to kind of skim through a few of the um, a few of the comments as they were coming in. Um, I think one thing that I that I do really want to highlight is is to to not overstate the potential impacts of an exercise like this. These are very low income households uh, that, that we're working with. And in some ways, the kind of first and foremost development concern is finding ways to increase income, right? That it's always going to be a huge challenge to make very scarce resources last over the course of the year. What I think this intervention and, and the documentation that we're providing is trying to show is that even conditional and very low incomes, these incomes can be stretched in a way that helps households during the time of the year when allocating those resources either toward consumption or toward productive investments can help people's welfare. And then in addition, you know, yes, eight or nine percent increase in harvest off of a very low base is still a small harvest, it's still low income. But it's really what's really important here is that this is an increase in production that we're able to see without the injection of any outside resources. And so that's, you know, in some ways to me, that is the most surprising finding out of this is that is that without providing any external resources, that just through reallocation, households are actually able to boost their incomes just a bit. Now again, kind of to the to the question and to some of the others that, that have come up in the chat, you know, this is not leading households to, you know, be free from hunger by any means. What it's doing is helping them just smooth those relatively scarce resources a, a, a little bit better. So in this setting, um, households do tend to hit zero. So they do tend to fully deplete their maize stock to answer the question a little bit more concretely. And that's part of what in, in, in prior work, and I think in some of the, the comments in the chat was also coming up, that's why households tend to rely, the low income households in particular in these settings, tend to rely on the labor market later in the agricultural cycle as a way of supplementing the income that they're getting from their own production. And typically in the setting, what they're doing is they're not selling household labor to town or something like that, because that would require a lot of transportation and other things like that, but rather they're just selling this labor to households who are in the community or nearby communities who have a bit more resources available, maybe the slightly richer households. So, you know, so that's kind of the, the, the type of context that you should have in mind, but, you know, but what is, you know, what is important here is to, is to you know, keep, keep in mind that, again, this is not sort of graduating people from poverty by any means. It's just taking relatively small resources and helping to, to smooth them a bit better. Great. Kelsey, thank you. Can, um, I, can I just address that one in part? Uh, uh, in general, I mean, the, the production levels per household um, should be good to last farmers uh, from one harvest to another, maybe for 75 percent of, of households. Um, but you know, as the study shows, you know, most of them use that as their only source of income to meet multiple demands. So they tend to to sell the maize, and but if they, it was just for consumption, uh, it would probably last them from one harvest to another, at least for about 75 percent. But you know, others too won't be able to produce sufficiently. Over. That's right. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Harry. Um, so we did have a question about uh, post-harvest losses, whether those were um, 
kind of one of the things that households may have um, over or underestimated. Do you have any uh, information about that? Yeah, so it's it's a it's a very good question. I think that in in this setting, what we have tried to document before related to post harvest losses is that they're they're you know it depends on sort of what you're expecting, but you know but the, that it appears to be somewhat modest. Um, I think one thing to to keep in mind is again I I kind of mentioned it at some point during the the presentation, but one thing that's kind of important about this setting that's also true in you know I think many of the settings where we might think this type of intervention is is relevant is that um, households are very experienced, right? And so, and so having gone through harvest, through to the hungry season, through to the next harvest, and experiencing whatever losses tend to happen, that that you know, in many ways, is, is again something that 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 people know. And so, whether they're kind of under appreciating that or under you know, not not sort of adequately incorporating that into their planning, I think that. You know, potentially is part of what's going on here. So we had, you know, some categories on the board around kind of uh, shocks and other kinds of things like that. You know, that could have been a place where people could allocate actually a bag to say or part of a bag to say that, you know, we expect to lose this to pests or rot or other things like that. That could go exactly into this budgeting board. So it was kind of designed to allow for losses due to you know unforeseen things to, to exactly enter into somebody's kind of budget or their or their plan one kind of limitation of the data that we were able to collect is is uh it wasn't feasible to figure out exactly to keep track of exactly what every person's allocation was and then how they adhered to or deviated from it and so on and so I didn't have time in, in today's presentation, but we've done some follow up work to try to better account for all of the different things, how people are allocating things. It's much more time intensive rather than just going through this budgeting exercise to try to track exactly how people are, are allocating uh, every bit of their resource, making their own budget. But uh, but we do think that that's you know, one way to try to figure out how much are the, the post harvest loss is accounting for. The one other thing that I'll say on that is that we so this is a setting where some households store grain in bags, some households store grain in, in small granaries, kind of home constructed granaries that are outside of their house. We intentionally sampled households that stored in bags so that it would be easy for us to keep track of their grain savings over the course of the year. Storing in bags actually does tend to lead to slightly lower losses than storing in these much more open granaries, which are more susceptible to pests and moisture and other things like that. So, you know, if anything, maybe this is a subsample that has a few, you know, less problems with uh, with post harvest losses. But anyway, the, it's a great question. It's an important part of it. We think it shows up in what we're doing in the form of this is going to be kind of a shock to your budget and uh, and can be certainly accommodated in the approach that we're taking. Great, thank you, Kelsey. Um, so one question, kind of a uh, little bit of a, a challenge to the to the results here um, presented, but uh, a question from Kim Siegel about um, whether some of the effects or the impacts of the um, of this intervention um, was because the participants knew that they would be checked on again um, at the end. Did you see any of that uh, in your in your study, and was there a way to kind of tell it all? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. And it's one that, you know, in any kind of research we have to we have to worry about, you know, what what is the effect of just knowing that you're part of a study? What is the effect of, you know, researchers coming in and asking you a bunch of questions and other things like that? So a couple of things related to that. So one is that um, that uh, households in both the treatment and the control group knew that we were going to be coming back and uh, and checking on their main stocks and checking on other things. And so to the extent that there's just an overall effect of you know, kind of experiment or demand or a Hawthorne effect or, you know, however you want to think about it, to the extent that that doesn't interact with treatment, that's going to be there in both the treatment and control group. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, we've, we've thought a lot about this. It's, a, it's an important question to always bring up in, in these types of projects. But um, one thing is that, uh, that, you know, when we ask people, for example, to forecast their expenditures, then they go through the budgeting exercise and then we're asking them, you know, again about forecasted expenditures and other things like that. 
different things are moving in different directions. So, so households are actually increasing their expected expenditures. If we thought that this was all kind of coming through the fact that you're being observed and, and all of that, we might expect to see that instead things are kind of moving in the same direction and people are saying like, oh, no, 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 I'm going to be really careful. I'm not going to spend very much. Uh, whereas, you know, projected savings go in a, in a different direction and so on. So, you know, I think it's, it's somewhat hard to reconcile the full set of results that we have with exclusively being driven by something like Hawthorne effects. Certainly, I firmly believe that the research that we do does affect behavior, you know, that, that going in and collecting surveys and all of that. And so I think that the, you know, the, the main thing that I would say is I, I don't think we see patterns that suggest that most of the treatment effects are being driven by that. Of course, it's very difficult to have kind of a pure control where we're not doing the surveys and we're not kind of reminding people about all sorts of different things. But, um, but to the extent that it's affecting both the treatment and control group, I think we can interpret the treatment effects still as, you know, as arising from what differed across these two groups. Great, thank you. Um, okay, a couple quick questions that maybe um, you know anyone can jump in on. But uh, is it assumed that the households are totally dependent on their farms as a source of food, or are there um, external kind of uh, things to consider? Um, good. So I think that that's you know in some ways quite related to the to the earlier question of can you know maize resources last uh, throughout the year? And I think you know to to Henry's response and and my response to that, I think that you know in many cases households are are you know there's a lot of heterogeneity in these settings. So, you know, some households have great harvest, some households have very terrible harvest, some households have big families with lots of labor and lots of land available. Some, you know, are very, very constrained, female headed households, for example. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot, lot of diversity. And so even, I, it's hard to speak, yeah, you know, I'm speaking in averages quite a lot, but, you know, I think we need to, to keep in mind that not all households, even in a small village in Zambia, look, look the same. Um, but that said, uh, so so I think that just covering consumption needs, oftentimes the maze is adequate. Covering all of the investment needs, all of the health shocks, all of the other things that uh, that happen, I think that that's where we do see a fair amount of reliance on uh, on the labor market. Um, what uh, what I think is important to keep in mind is that income is just not very diversified in this setting. So there are just not many other things. You can work in agriculture on your own farm and get the returns of that agricultural, that labor investment through your own harvest. You can sell your labor to somebody else, but you're typically selling it to their farm and they're gonna get returns to your labor at some point in the future. You're gonna get some wage income today. And so it's a very agricultural setting. Uh, you know, we're working, that is by design. We've kind of intentionally chosen to go into the setting where income flows are quite limited because we think that that is an important place where this kind of smoothing problem is kind of tractable. One of the challenges, of course, of thinking about moving out of this setting where it's very kind of, in some ways, very uniform and that there's a single rainfall event every year, such that everybody's getting their harvest income at more or less the same time of year. Everybody's drawing down their resources at more or less the same time of year. So you're experiencing scarcity in the hungry season as a community, not just one individual. All of those things are sort of important features of this setting. If we think about generalizing to other settings where income flows are more diverse, where some households may get their paycheck on the 15th of the month, others may get their paycheck at the end of the month, others may be getting hourly, you know, or daily uh, uh, payments, that there in those kinds of settings, we think that these types of and potential tools are, are equally important, but they're a little harder to figure out exactly how the intervention looks. Whereas in this setting, it's it's from a just from a research perspective, it's a relatively straightforward one to think about doing you know an intervention like this at a particular time of the year in the same way for all households. Great, thank you, Harry or Crystal. Any additional comments to that one? Um, yeah, I think uh, Gisli is right that. Um, um, the the majority of these these households just depend on their own production. If they run out of that food, um, they have to find other means. And they would be lucky if they have relatives in town who can send them money, so that they can go and buy. Uh, some might be on cash transfer programs, which are implemented by the government, so those might have a bit of relief. Um, but others uh, resort to the forest, uh, as I said earlier, on maybe either to go and produce charcoal 
and sell in the urban areas where people use, use charcoal for cooking or um, and just maybe look for 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 products that come from the forest yeah those are the kind of options but the bulk of them would just depend on their own on, on grains and if they run out then that's that's really serious trouble for them thank you Harry um so there is a question uh, so Kelsey you mentioned kind of uh that this intervention can be incorporated uh potentially into a lot of other existing kind of programming um uh and someone also asked about kind of whether in this setting in Zambia, um, there are kind of any village savings and loan organizations or any other kind of um, savings groups that um, might be already in existence and could work kind of in conjunction with this, uh, with this research or are they actually um, not complementary? So if you could go into that a little bit. Great. So that's a that's a wonderful question, um, and I think we've been thinking a lot about this, uh, and really welcome you know I, creative ideas for for um, for thinking this through with us. But I guess my sort of my thought, uh, you know, as, as somebody who is intimately involved with this research, so maybe I'm kind of overly optimistic about it. Speaking of uh, over optimism, um, is that this is complementary to many, many, many different types of interventions. So in particular, if you think about an organization, I mentioned cash transfers, so let me talk about that for a moment. Um, you know, I think increasingly we're seeing that cash transfers are an approach that uh, governments and organizations are interested in using for poverty alleviation. Um, oftentimes those cash transfers are done with you know, some financial literacy training, some other kinds of, uh, of exercises with households. It's not just, you know, parachuting and dropping some cash on people. We think that this could be incorporated into uh, whatever kind of orientation enrollment kind of thing that, that, uh, that households are, are going through to be part of a cash transfer program. Uh, similarly, um, a microfinance organization, for example, you know, we, we could imagine that at the time that you're uh, getting disbursement of a loan, that you're going through some kind of exercise to make sure that the resources associated with that loan and whatever other income a household has is going to be kind of spread over time in a way that allows for optimal investment uh, associated with that, with that loan. So, you know, those are a few examples, you know, I think also local organizations, the village, village savings and loan, for example, you know, being given this type of tool such that households, uh, when they're getting their kind of payout from, you know, different institution, but from some kind of a roster or something like that, when it's your turn to get the payout, maybe getting some kind of budgeting tool uh, that goes along with that could be very, could be very kind of helpful. So those are all on the kind of finance side and thinking about you know, income flows and cash flows. I think we could similarly think about this for an agricultural uh, or, you know, for, for an organization that, that is more focused on agricultural productivity. Similarly, if you're giving trainings to farmers on adopting some new technology or some cr cropping practice or some other thing, that this type of budgeting tool could be incorporated. And I think what we've seen again is that this is potentially very complementary, where if that new agricultural technology, if that, you know, practice that that, that farmers are, are potentially adopting, if that also requires that there's steady investment in either labor or other inputs over the course of the year, that it's extraordinarily important that households are accurately forecasting what they're going to be and, and, and saving appropriately. Again, I think that I don't want to kind of overstate the benefits of this, like if you have no way to securely save, if post-harvest losses are extraordinarily high, if you have no access to, to secure savings, that of course is going to make it more difficult to save, right? And so, you know, so again, I think there's a, a strong complementary here, com complementarity here where, where the more op opportunities to save in ways that households feel confident in and feel like their savings are going to be secure, the easier it's going to be to make a forecast of what you want to save and then actually do it, where if savings feel very, very insecure, you know, that's a barrier, I think, potentially to this type of thing uh, actually working. So, you know, so those are some initial ideas that that I have about kind of complementarities and, and settings. But again, I think that there are, you know, many potential applications that I'd be super excited to, to talk through with people, you know, potentially through uh, through some follow up. 
Great, fabulous, thank you. Um, I have a quick question about um, whether there was any um, additional uh, data collected around gender breakdowns um, and whether there were any implications of that within the research. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So, um, and it's something that we've been uh, starting to think more about kind of in, in the course of how do we scale this up? So what we did uh, in this exercise is we asked to work with the head of household, the person who was kind of in charge of financial decisions for the household, because we thought what was most important was to change the beliefs of that person of how tight is the budget going to be over the course of the year. Now, the drawback of that, of course, is that how that gets communicated to other members of the household who are also doing, you know, spending or other kinds of, you know, decision making and, and so on. I, uh, we don't know exactly how that kind of all translates through. In our sample, about 75% of respondents were males. Uh, the 25% of respondents that were females, you know, by design were mostly female headed households. And so we can't say much about sort of the gender of who gets this budgeting exercise because female headed households, you know, you're, you're, you, the, the comparison is not just the gender of the respondent, it's also many other things that in this setting, you know, are associated with smaller household sizes, uh, typically lower incomes, other things um, for, for female headed households. I think a very important thing as we think about moving forward and scaling up would be to actually test whether the gender of the person who's going through the budgeting exercise, how that affects outcomes. And also potentially, so we, in, we sort of intentionally didn't try to do this budgeting exercise with you know, both adult members of the household or something like that, largely for coordination reasons that in my experience, trying to do a survey uh, where both spouses are present just uh, it leads to a lot of logistical challenges. So this was sort of a convenience decision but it was one that, that when we think about scaling this up, allowing households to choose who participates, allowing households to uh, have both spouses participate, allow, you know, that there are many different things that, that you could imagine start to be uh, quite important. And if we think that in a lot of uh, rural households in particular, that women are doing a lot of the decision making around consumption and potentially around health and schooling, that, you know, that it may be equally important to involve them in this very initial exercise. So that's a long way of saying like, no, sorry, we don't, we don't have a whole lot to say about gender, but it is something that, that I think we're uh, excited about learning about in, uh, in the next chapter of this work. Great, great, thank you. So I think we have time for maybe one more um, question. Um, and there was two here that were kind of related. Um, one from Kim Siegel about um, whether there was any research uh, that you kind of paid attention to um, that some of the planning or underestimating or over overestimating had to do with kind of the religion of the participants or um, some kind of idea of, of fatalism, you know, that God will provide or um, you know, so forward planning isn't as important. And then a related question was um, from uh, Michael Carter about kind of uh, looking at gloominess and whether these um, participants were kind of already assuming kind of either the worst or yeah. um, it seems like in your case, kind of uh, not assuming the worst. So is yeah. there anything around kind of those, some of those psychosocial issues that you looked into? Yeah, I think those are those are all really, really good questions. And I think one thing that in in this project we have not done fully is try to, you know, there's kind of what we refer to as like the micro foundations of of kind of what underlies people's over optimism about what resources they're going to have into the future. One of the things that um that I didn't have time to show you is we we do a bunch of follow-up work to to basically ask the question of, you know, I've said a couple of times, households are very experienced with these cycles. And so that kind of begs the question of what, what impedes learning, right? So if you've experienced abundance followed by scarcity many, many times, and there is the potential, I think, as we've shown in this, in this research to offset at least a little bit of that later scarcity, certainly not all of it, but a little bit of that later scarcity, you know, why are people not kind of 
doing this. And so one of the things that we do that I think kind of speaks to some of the, the questions that you're raising is we ask people uh, to recall, to look backwards, to try to remember um, their own resources in the past. And so we do this when we come back to people after the full agricultural year, you know, recall that we tried to measure their savings in the middle of the year. We asked them at the beginning to forecast what they would have. Now we're asking them to recall what they had. And one thing that's very striking is that we see that people are also like experiencing what we call rosy memory, that they're, that they're overly kind of optimistic in their backcasting of what they actually had at that point in time. And a fairly large share of their forecasting error can be also explained by how people recall the past. And so I think that that's, that that's important because if you tend to remember hard times as being less hard than they actually were, that makes it very hard to then forecast forward and say, well, next time is going to be hard again. And yet what we haven't done, which I would love to do, is ask people during the scarce time to forecast the next scarce time. My prior is that people will be very accurate at that time of the year in knowing that they're going to be out of resources again in the hungry season uh, the following year. And so there's something I think about that. You know, it's maybe the the opposite of Rashid's uh, kind of gloominess. That that instead, it's that that your kind of present circumstances kind of loom large in how you both think about the past and think about the future, and that's fundamentally challenging. The other thing, and I'm going to I'll say it very quickly, but it's but I think it's a very interesting fact is that we also ask households to forecast not just for themselves but also for their neighbors, for households like them how much savings are they going to have in the future? And the thing that is very striking is that they put themselves in like the 90th percentile. They basically think that they are outliers in the distribution across the board. So everybody thinks that, oh, my neighbor's gonna run out of food, but no, no, not me. And so again, people are sort of accurate in terms of, under they understand that these cycles are out there. They understand that the hungry season happens but there is this kind of persistent, I mean, over-optimism is you know, a little bit of a, a funny use of the word, but it's basically you know, that the people are sort of over-optimistic about their own circumstances relative to their peers and, and their neighbors. And so again, that makes it hard to update your own forecast if you think that, yeah, maybe it's gonna be bad for other people, but it's not gonna be so bad for me. And so we think that these are, you know, these are not necessarily answering the, the great questions that were posed directly, but rather I think they're highlighting some of the reasons that, uh, you know, that, that make it very difficult to go from, you know, the control group in our study to, to the treatment group without something that feels like a structured way of just thinking things through, because what's in people's heads is just not that. And I think this is like just a very human thing. This is in many ways very deeply rooted in psychology. And so, you know, what's kind of fun as, as economists is we get to come in and bring the tools around evaluation and around testing and data collection and so on at a field scale with some of the insights that come from, you know, the deep rich studies uh, from coming out of psychology. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, that was a, a great way to end. Uh, I'm going to pass just for our last few minutes to Christina to kind of help us wrap this wonderful webinar up today. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. And thanks so much, Kelsey, for a great presentation on this research. I just wanted to say that at the I'm based at the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley. I work really closely with this project team, and we're really excited to be supporting this kind of research, looking at sort of the psychological mechanisms underlying um, these phenomena that we see, especially around seasonal hunger um, and consumption smoothing, and then coming out of this work, um, ideas around budget neglect. And um, I'll just drop my email in the chat for anyone who needs to reach out about questions or learning more or any interest in partnerships where we're open to um, speaking with folks about that. Um, and I'll remind everyone again that a recording of this presentation will be available online through AgriLinks. Um, and I'd like to thank them so much for their help in organizing all of this. Um, we're also posting with um, the Markets Risk and Resilience Lab, we're also posting policy briefs um, and other sort of uh, summaries of these results. And um, you'll be sure to see papers coming out soon. So thanks so much for your time and for engaging with us on this research. It's, it's been really great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.